So here in Denmark, Halloween is also called Ella Hellions Aften. And it has a follow-up on the first Sunday of November, Ella Hellions Day. Historically, it was a day to remember saints and martyrs. But nowadays, it's a day where we light up a candle and remember those that have passed since the last time it was Ella Hellions Day. And generally send a little bit of a thought to our ancestors. I don't believe in the paranormal or the supernatural, but I do believe that there is something different about this day. Something about like the barrier or the veil between this world and like whatever is on the other side is just a little thinner than it is on every other day. So why not use this occasion to resurrect some of my dead videos? <laughs> During Madness Marathon I ended up scrapping four videos. And I don't quite know why I did it, but I can think of no better time to bring them back than now. So here they are, back from the dead. Horrified of the World's Madness Marathon. 31 days, 31 recommendations, hours of fun. Postal 2 is not a horror game, but I do think that it appeals to horror fans due to how it's set up. It's technically just a game about trying to make your wife happy and going out and doing your chores like buying milk, returning over to library books, etc. It's just that Postal 2 is also a game where you can unzip your pants and piss into someone's mouth until they barf. You don't have to, but there is that option. And the game deliberately puts you into very boring and very dull scenarios where you might be tempted to do things like that to stave out that whole boredom thing. It's a game that tempts you and that's interesting. Then on top of that, it's incredibly glitchy. So out of nowhere, Gary Coleman of sitcom fame might just decide that he doesn't like you and whip out a machine gun and then start firing at you. Postal is interesting, it's a social experiment. It's not a horror game, although it is horrible. There's also a mod for it called Eternal Damnation that you can play for free if you just download the free fudge pack install of Postal 2 and then the mod off of ModDB. It's a total conversion horror game that opens up as you, the protagonist, stops your girlfriend from being assaulted by, um, by a man that the subtitles credits as rapists. Yeah, the game just goes there. John Murray, our protagonist, goes maybe just a little overboard with the whole like stubbing of the assault and he ends up locked up in an asylum as a result but not for long. During just another day at the Looney Bin there is a breakout at the asylum and some madman lets out all the prisoners including John and John finds himself fighting his way through the asylum but there is clearly something wrong. John is not quite right in the head. During our escape we repeatedly fight another inmate that can telepathically throw objects and we keep seeing weird arms attempt to reach out and grab us through the walls and they only seem to appear when there is no one around us but us to see them. Which of course begs the question, are they real? Eternal Damnation is a really competent horror experience, so you might wonder why the people that made it chose Postal 2 as the game to convert. Because Postal 2 is, you know, it's Postal 2 and as a result of being Postal 2 it's quite unstable. But that's kind of what enhances the experience. Playing Postal 2 and trying to go for a pacifist playthrough is like riding a unicycle that's on fire while you're also trying to juggle chainsaws and AIDS infected needles. It's not gonna end up pretty no matter how well you do it and at some point either something very big or like a tiny pebble is gonna bump the unicycle and you're gonna slash off your own arm with a chainsaw or something. Eternal Damnation, it takes this feature of the game and it puts a horror spin on it. See, there are these open-ended sections where you're just trying to make your way to an apartment and as a player you're just waiting for someone to get pissed at you because you looked at them wrong and start opening fire, which will make everyone in town go crazy and turn on you and try to kill you. And in a game like this, where you're this haunted guy, the usual hijinks of Postal 2 are replaced with this sense of unease that you feel because you don't feel welcome in this town. And not in the fun way where the townspeople dislike you because you have a habit of piercing in their mouths. It's strangely powerful even though it looks like hot garbage. 
the Templar Nation did not win any awards and I'm not sure a lot of people outside of those two community are aware that it exists but it does and it's a very novel experience. It doesn't quite look like any other horror game. It doesn't quite talk like any other horror game and it definitely doesn't play quite like any other horror game. And if you're in the mood to try something fresh, I fully recommend it. Horrified at the World's Madness Marathon. 31 days, 31 recommendations, hours of fun. Few will argue that the Resident Evil movies are, you know, high art, faithful to the source material, or, you know, good. I kind of like the first four, but I understand why people don't. They are dumb, and they are trashy, and they're not dumb and trashy in the way that regular Resident Evil is dumb and trashy. I'm sure if you are a fan of the series proper, watching them feels like having someone spit in your mouth, which I can verify it's not that hot if you're not into it. But there is one thing that I will defend about the movies, and that's the fact that they inspired a generation of video game developers. And right now you're probably going, what the fuck does that mean? And <laughs> let me tell you, a lot of the developers were inspired to make games because they played mods and then made mods and then games. Sandboxes like Gary's Mod have been a breeding ground for developers and a lot of genres and ideas were born from people playing around with games like Gary's Mod. And I had a front row seat to when Resident Evil movies created a horror shop genre. So what would happen back then is that a media property would become popular and then its influence could be seen in the Gmod community. Often you could see, you know, a weapon or an item or even a location from a movie recreated in Gmod. But then when Resident Evil Extinction came out, it made a lot of people rewatch the first two in preparation for the new movie. And it reminded a lot of people that these sections of the first movie where the cast has to survive a death maze that's full of zombies is a pretty fucking dope concept. Since Gmod already had zombies and spike pits, it was natural to just, you know, start recreating scenes and locations from the movie. And within a week, the game mode Red Queen had been born and then started growing and evolving, eventually morphing into Zombie Master as it was decided that it was a good idea to distance like the game mode from the movie, seeing as there were very few levels that paid homage to the lab scenes from the Resident Evil movie, and the concept has just outgrown the inspiration in general. And then, you know, Zombie Master unfortunately died, but not too long ago, it was like the zombies it features resurrected, and can now be downloaded on ModDB, and it's great. It's basically like if Left 4 Dead and some Panic Source had a baby. One player will be the titular zombie master and he will spawn zombies, start fires, trigger different events and even controls the zombies directly, not unlike how it's done in a real-time strategy game. And all meanwhile, the other players will play as the survivors and they will try like in Left 4 Dead and Zombie Panic Sauce and No More Room in Hell to make their way through the level, solving puzzles and doing objectives, while also trying to not die from the zombie master controlled zombies. If I had to point out one thing that I think is against this game currently, it is that it's a source mod, and those just aren't very popular right now, because people don't know that you don't need the Half-Life games to play source mods, and I think if this was standalone it would already have become a streamer classic, and would have had quite a few more players than the one I was playing with when I logged in on a Monday afternoon. But just to clarify, there's nothing wrong with the game itself. It's standalone, it's free, and you should give it a go. 8 out of 13. Horrified at the World's Madness Marathon. 31 days, 31 recommendations, hours of fun. You know a horror game is good when you're creeped out an hour before the spookening even starts, and Get Alive is one of those. You're a man from somewhere in Eastern Europe and you have stage 4 cancer. You will die, but until you literally drop dead, you're gonna keep the wheels of capitalism turning. So you have to go to work. 
and that's where the game already gets interesting. See, you don't just have cancer, you have brain cancer, and just the act of getting to work is really difficult. The game plays with you here, because you're a gamer, you're on gamer autopilot, so you don't pay attention to the dialogue when you're told the instruction to get to where you're going, and somehow that just put you into the shoes of this person that has brain cancer and has to take several different subways to get to their job because you get lost. At least I did anyways. I think that's a real clever idea. Prey upon gamer instincts to make a meaningful point about something. It created a sense of unease. I felt like the protagonist did. I felt confused. And when I arrived at his place of employment, I didn't question that everything seemed a little off. I didn't question that none of the stuff that any of the NPCs had to say made any sense to me. I didn't question that I should be the one to go down to the basement and turn on a generator. I just accepted that that was what I had to do. And then I turned on the generator and then zombies started chasing me and I ran away. But before I could figure out if they were real or if they were a brain fog demon caused by the protagonist's cancer, they were gone. And in their place were visions that were definitely the machinations of brain fog demons. And then things were back to normal, at least for a minute or two, because soon after everything had returned to normal, men with masks and armbands were helicoptered in and they started shooting at me and I didn't know why. I just fired back and what followed was an intense 30 minute gun battle. And I couldn't tell if it was real or a brain fog demon apparition. And I'll leave it up to you to figure out which is which. 9 out of 13. Horrified at the world's madness marathon. 31 days, 31 recommendations, hours of fun. Dear Esther, I sometimes feel as if I. Dear Esther is a game that everyone knows by name, but few have played and even few remember the controversy surrounding. It used to be a game that you couldn't speak of in gaming circles without conversation, discussion, arguments and even fights erupting. Because Dear Esther was a walking sim. Except that we didn't have the word walking sim back then. And most people called it an interactable painting. Which a lot of journalists scoffed at because you don't interact with anything in the game. Ha ha ha. Funny quip, so clever. And also whether or not that this type of experience should cost money and how much money it should cost. And a lot of people didn't think it should cost this much and I guess I, I agree a little bit. It is 10 bucks and it is over in 20 minutes and I do believe that a movie ticket's price should give you a movie length experience. That seems fair. A lot of people bought it because since the game was just a map without any buildings or objects really, the developer could really crank up the flora and it's beautiful, especially for the time. So it was a bit of a PC benchmark for people to see how well their PCs could run Dear Esther. You can imagine the outrage that gamer had over a game that they didn't feel was worth money being moderately popular because people with good PCs would buy it to see the pretty graphics. There were even strawman arguments like, oh, because it costs money I'm being robbed of getting to experience the beautiful story. I shouldn't be locked out of this experience because I'm poor and can't buy it, much less run it, yada yada yada. This game was legitimately more controversial than Postal 2, which had released, you know, a few years earlier. A game where you can get gonorrhea, piss into a stranger's mouth until they vomit, and then kick their face off with your boot. But what is it all about? Well, for one, it's free, and it has always been free, which is why I'm recommending it. Um, it was originally a mod before it was a game, and the mod is fully playable and has been since day one. It's a little rough around the edges nowadays, partly due to the Source SDK updates that have come out since then, but it's playable, and I'm sure that you can make your version of the game look a lot better than mine. But the actual experience, it's fine. It's a story about a man that grieves the loss of the titular Esther, and he monologues about that and his descent into madness while he climbs up to a radio tower and then in classic indie game fashion, it ends not with a bang, but 
with a whimper. And you're supposed to draw your own conclusions as to what happened, yada yada yada, you know the drill. It's pretty alright, even the scuffed version. And I figured I'd let everyone know that it's available for free in some form. 7 out of 13. Play it if you remember the outrage and want to see for yourself what the game that everyone was so angry was actually about. Horrified at the world's madness marathon. 31 days, 31 recommendations, hours of fun. And so that was four underrated horror games that you can download right now. I hope you like what you saw and I hope you maybe downloaded one or two of the games that I featured here. Or maybe some of the 31 games that I featured on Madness Marathon proper. Have a great Ella Hillians day and uh, yeah, I'll see you around out there. From all of us here at Horrified at Worlds, stay extra spooky during this season and uh, take care and good night.